Optometry Student Challenge. It's sponsored by ABB Optical Group and Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care. This is the second year that we've done this live poster presentation to give students, faculty, and colleagues an advanced look into the very talented students that we have in our competition today. The Optometry Student Challenge is a competitive platform for third and fourth year optometry students to submit abstracts of contact lens based case studies and report projects. Each student is vying for an opportunity to turn their abstract into a poster presentation at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium in January of 2022. We thank GSLS for their participation in this event. Six students were chosen from the abstract submissions and these finalists will be presenting their posters today. Unfortunately, one of our students had to drop out of the competition due to an unforeseen circumstance. Therefore, five contestants are presenting. The three winners are chosen to receive an opportunity to present their posters at GSLS and a $1,500 travel grant to attend. This year, two students and their work will be recognized as honorable mention and will receive $250 each. We have a great group of students uh, submitting abstracts this year, the largest group we've ever had, and many schools were represented. You should be proud of all the work that you've done as students. The quality of work presented this year made the judging for this first round extremely difficult. The determination of the finalist will be very was very difficult due to the quality of abstracts submitted. We are honored to have these five finalists presenting their posters today. Cindy Lamb from Herbert Wertheim School of Optometry, formerly known as Berkeley School of Optometry. Miriam Faturai, Faturai, sorry about that, from the Massachusetts College of Pharma, Pharmacy and Health Sciences School of Optometry. Jennifer Dang, from Salus University, Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Veronia Abdir from Nova, East, uh, Southeastern College of Optometry. And finally, Calisandra Larson from Pacific University College of Optometry. They've done an excellent job at preparing these abstracts and turning them into posters for presentation. During the presentation, we will be doing a poll for each one of our presentations. Here's how the scoring works. The four judges will score the poster presentations for 50%, and the remaining 50% score will be derived from the attendees voting in real time via live poll. The attendees are encouraged to vote after each presentation. The polling option will come up on the screen immediately after each presentation is finished. You will be asked to vote in five different categories, and those categories are listed on the screen. Your votes will be tabulated and the winners announced within 24 hours of the presentation. After each presentation, there will also be a time to ask questions. Please type the questions into the question and answer box, and we will answer them immediately. Results of this competition will be communicated to the winners and honorable mentions recipients by December 10th. Our first presenter is Cindy Lamb. Cindy is from San Francisco. She's a native. She finished her fourth year at Berkeley. She is in her fourth year at Berkeley. She has also studied public health and business there at, at the university at Berkeley. On her bucket list, after graduation is to have a corgi, but the interesting piece is she's allergic to dogs. Cindy, take it away. All right, hi everyone, I'm Cindy Lamb. I drew the lucky straw to go first. Thank you for spending your time with us. Um, so for my poster, I did a case on an ortho K fitting on a post LASIK patient. So the question is, can we flatten an already oblate cornea? 
So some statistics, since LASIK was FDA approved in 1999, 10 million Americans have gotten the surgery and most do really well are very happy with their vision the next day. Um, however, 9.4% of post LASIK patients don't end up seeing 2020 five years after surgery. So of course, an enhancement can be offered. However, with any surgery, there are risks, including an increased risk of post lasik ectasia, epithelial ingrowth, um, infection, corneal haze, et cetera. So for patients like these who do have some residual myopia, is Ortho-K an option for them? So here is our patient. She is a 27-year-old Asian female who presents for an ortho-K fitting. Her chief complaint is that she's having more trouble driving without any glasses, as well as seeing freeway signs. And although she's tried a couple soft contact lenses in the past year, it's a little bit uncomfortable and she'd rather just have uncorrected daytime vision. So in terms of her medical history, pretty unremarkable except for some eczema, environmental and pet allergies, and her LASIK uh, surgery was in 2016 in both eyes. She was a moderate myope at the time, minus 325 OU, and the surgery went smoothly without any complications. Uh, however, after starting graduate school, her myopia did progress at about a quarter diopter per year. So um, she has also worn ortho-K lenses and soft contact lenses in the past, so she's very comfortable with insertion and removal there. So here is her baseline data. As you can see in slit lamp, you can see that perfectly circular LASIK scar, very well healed, and it's also very evident in her topography. Uh, in terms of her uncorrected vision, she is seeing 2040 minus two, thus the trouble driving. And she is correctable to 2015 with a manifest of minus one um, sphere and minus 50 sill with, with the rule of stigmatism. And surprisingly, her Ks are still pretty average at around 43. And her white to white is also pretty average at around 11.6. Slit lamp findings were unremarkable except for one plus papillae in her lower lid, which probably contributes to her soft contact lens discomfort. All right. So moving to the ortho K fitting process, um, we just went through the process like any regular patient. We use the Paragon CRT calculator as Paragon CRT lenses are our most available fitting set at school. And we calculated the base curve based on her targeted myopia correction minus the Jessen or compression factor, um, and then determine the RZD and landing zone angle from there as well. So from there, we fitted her with some Paragon dual axis CRT lenses, uh, base curve of 8.4, 11.0 diameter, the regular um, six millimeter optic zone, and equal in both eyes. At um, her exam, they looked like they were a pretty good fit. So we went ahead and dispensed it. At her one day follow-up, as we can see, it's not very ideal. There is moderate superior temporal decentration in both lenses. Um, this is just a snapshot here with some dimple veiling. And the patient did report irritation after her overnight wear and lens awareness in that left eye more than the right. Um, and then the treatment zone is also decentered superiorly and temporally. However, her vision was correctable to 2015, um, pretty, pretty ideal auto refraction over that left eye. Um, despite changing some parameters like the RZD and the diameter to get a better centration, these trial lenses continued to look similar to this presentation. So in school, we also learned that a photo doesn't really do everything justice. So a video is better than a snapshot because it's just one second in time. So here we see more of that decentration, um, that lens awareness probably with each blink and that dimple veiling. So from there, we decided to fit her into a different lens, a VST lens, specifically the IC lens. Um, and at Berkeley, we've had pretty good success fitting higher myopes or those with thyroid eye disease who've had some trouble with centration. Um, so we started with an IC lens and let me go back, sorry. 
We didn't use a calculator for this. We actually worked directly with a consultant as it was a special case. We don't see a lot of post-LASIK patients wanting to go back into ortho -K. Um, so we sent over the topography and they sent over the empirical fit based on the um, apical Ks as well as um, what the K readings were at the eight to nine millimeter cord length. So these lenses obviously look very well centered compared to the one before. Um, we fit her into 8.28 base curve, 10.8 diameter, a smaller optic zone, and these IC lenses also come in a plus one power, and they have custom alignment curves. So there are three peripheral curves here. Um, in terms of the evaluation, very well centered, small treatment zone, and the trace temporal decentration, that left eye, um, which there's always a little more lens awareness for this patient. And then the topography also looks pretty good. And she is seeing very well with the lenses and without the lenses with a pretty ideal auto refraction. Again, a video is better than a photo. So we can see it's centering much better than the CRT lenses. Previously, there is, again, a very strong blink that decenters the lens, but the lenses just jump right back up. To explain why VST lenses might center a little bit better than CRT lenses um, is because of the aspheric base curve, as well as the multiple alignment curves that you can customize. So compared to this tangent landing zone in CRT lenses, the curved landing design here really just hugs the cornea a little bit better. Um, that's why sometimes higher myopes can also have success with these lenses. So some clinical pearls that I learned from this case was that LASIK surgeons typically center the flap over the pupil center just to reduce aberrations. And a study found that the pupil is actually a little bit superiorly nasally decentered, about 0.17 millimeters nasally and 0.26 millimeters superiorly. And for this patient, you can see that is the case as well. It's just a little bit superior nasal. And here it's very close to that nasal limbus. So we had more trouble with this left eye fitting. And I'm just outlining the LASIK flap that you can see underneath the lens. And understandably, this might cause that lens to be decentered a little bit more temporally than that right eye and cause some more discomfort overnight. Um, so Topography and seeing where the LASIK flap is centered can really help predict or um, understand why this patient is having more trouble with that left eye. Second clinical pearl is that when we do auto refraction over ortho K lenses, you might find some against the rule cylinder that you don't find when you remove the lenses. So here at her one day follow-up with the Paragon CRTs, you're seeing a little bit of that against the rule cylinder as well as with the IC lenses. And that's because the lenses just create a tear lens effect that's asymmetric in each meridian. But once we remove that lens, we don't see that leftover astigmatism. Finally, here I will reveal that I am both the student clinician for this case, as well as the patient herself. Um, I am in my fourth year of optometry school, so I caused my own nearsightedness and I want to kind of get into a myopia control option. And with boards tomorrow, I can attest that even with just two hours of sleep, I do see very well throughout the day and throughout the night. So a lot of ortho K patients wash out because they're not getting enough sleep in college, but with low myopes, even just two hours of sleep is adequate versus the eight hours of sleep we might recommend. So in conclusion, we can fit ortho K lenses on a post LASIK oblate cornea. And I have some references here and I just wanna thank my mentors, Dr. Maria Liu, Dr. Sarah Singh and Dr. Celia Gong for helping me through the fitting process and teaching me all about contact lenses. I will answer any questions. Perfect, Cindy, thank you. Do we have any questions for Cindy? Please type those into the question and answer box. What role do you think 
the optic zone has in success of fitting LASIK patients in ortho -K? Great question. Um, I think like Paragon just released a five millimeter OZD. I, th I think it is a great option and we have seen maybe more success with troublesome patients or those with some leftover astigmatism when we just condense that treatment zone. Uh, we don't make, need a dual axis lens sometimes. Um, so it is a great option that we have. One more question. What consideration are there when fitting a lens like this over a LASIK flap? Great question. Um, just monitoring the fit, making sure it's healthy as always. Um, for me with that left eye, that lens, we want to make sure it's not irritating that nasal flap as it is very close. We want to make sure there's adequate edge lift in that area. Um, so we're not causing any like limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, however, five years out, the LASIK flap is, is pretty well healed. We're not really worried about dislocating the flap at all um, or causing any issues there. Perfect. Do you think you've achieved an acceptable result um, if you'd had a bigger uh, myo pre-LASIK um, or a flatter cornea post-op? Yeah, I think um, this patient or me, very lucky in that I had a good amount. I had average Ks. I was just a low myope. I don't think this would be as successful in a higher myope, especially a flatter cornea. Um, that was maybe a minus six pre-LASIK since there's less cornea to flatten as well. Um, so it really depends on your patient coming in, whether their Ks are 38 versus 44, um, whether we're just correcting a little bit of myopia or if they have like against the rule of astigmatism or something that would be difficult to correct even in a regular cornea. All right, perfect. Thank you, Cindy. Um, now um, we're gonna put up the um, poll and remember to rate these polls or each of these questions from one to five, five being the uh, most important and one being the least important. Our next participant will be Calisandra Larson. Calisandra is a third year student at Pacific uh, University College of Optometry. She's attended St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Um, for her undergraduate coursework, where she played bassoon and graduated with a degree in biology with a consideration in management studies. During her time at St. Olaf, she had the opportunity to work in the neuroelectrophysiology lab studying the IPRGCs with hatching snapping turtles. One of her favorite projects was working on the design of tiny polarized sunglasses to place on the turtles to investigate how they navigate from the nest to the water. Take it away, Calisandra. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Dee Dee. As she introduced myself, I am Calisandra Larson, and I'm going to be walking you through a case report about a patient I encountered earlier this semester who had a high apical corneal astigmatism that we ended up masking with a rigid corneal gas permeable lens. So the patient presented to clinic with complaints of a blurry vision, and he um, had no history of wearing any sort of spectacle correction. He also was a baseball player, um, and he reports that he had declining visual quality beginning around age 17, but before that, his vision was, quote, was perfect. So um, RM's history is significant for left blunt force ocular trauma and periorbital hematoma, secondary to baseball, and fights at ages 6, 7, and 14, but his vision was reported to be unaffected after each of these events. His entry of QDs were unaided and were 2040 minus in the right eye and 2060 minus in the left eye. Pinholes showed some improvement, but the patient was not able to achieve 2020 with either eye. The anterior and posterior signal exam, as well as the macular OCT, were all unremarkable. And as I said previously, this patient had no history of spectacle wear, but he did have a sporadic soft spherical contact lens 
square in the past. So kind of like what's next based on this case history for the patient, we ended up doing some topography. And here is the corneal topography of this patient's right eye. This is an axial power map. In the bottom right corner, um, as well as in the small text on the map, you can see the steep and the flat central case, which are 44 and a half and 58 and, and a quarter. Most eyes have a low difference between this flat and steep meridians, which is not the case here in RM's eye. RM's eye has high apical, meaning central, with the rule, meaning the flat meridian is essentially horizontal and regular corneal astigmatism, with the difference in the meridians that equals 13.75 diopters. The text in the white boxes here are the K values at a six millimeter cord. This is, I will refer to as a, the mid peripheral cornea. RM's cornea is nearly rotationally symmetric in this mid periphery. Since this mid peripheral area is where a rigid corneal gas permeable lens lands, we had a good indication that a corneal GP was a good option for this patient. Moving on to the left eye here, you can see that his apical delta K is 18 diopters, which is more than his left eye as is the mid peripheral difference in curvature. It's slightly more here than in his left eye. However, this 14, uh, excuse me, four and a half diopter difference in the mid periphery is manageable with a rigid bitoric lens. And since RM's cornea is with the rule, this also increases um, the chance of a favorable prognosis for a rigid gas permeable lens. I also want to bring to your attention how the flat meridian here across the 180 is the same in both his eyes. And that's gonna come into play um, since we typically fit GPs on flat K. So a couple of pearls or things to think about with this patient is how spectacles with 18 diopters of astigmatism correction is not feasible. Chromo, uh, excuse me, chromatic aberrations as well as distortion does not make visual quality very, um, does not produce good visual quality through uh, astigmatism correction of this degree. And the mid peripheral cornea, where corneal GP would land, is not nearly as torqued as the apex in this patient here. The best way to mask RM's corneal stigmatism and thus to improve RM's vision is to fit a non-flexing GP. We, so that's what we did. We trialed lenses from the available bitoric GP fitting set, equivalent to the patient's flat meridian, and most closely matching the delta K in his mid periphery. Here's um, his right eye. Just a little reminder, his mid peripheral delta K was two and a half diopters, and the flat K at that six millimeter core was 43 and a half diopters. So we picked 44 over 47 and a half as the lens to trial on his eye. Straight out of the fitting set first lens, we ended up with a great centration, appropriate edge lift, apical clearance, and unrestricted vertical movement. With the modifications from the over refraction, just a little bit of plus, this patient was seeing great, and we ended up dispensing this right lens. With the left lens, if you remember, his left eye had a little bit higher delta K and um, it was a four and a half diopter in the mid periphery, but the same flat K. We trialed that same lens that we fit on his right eye, but we found it to be too steep with the large peripheral bearing 360. And this can be explained by the topography, the difference between the right and the left eye because of the higher difference in curvature. So we ended up trying a secondary lens that was a little bit flatter 43 and a half over 47. And this has the same um, difference in, there's still three and a half diopters of difference in curvature between this lens trial. And we got a great fit, but minimal edge lift. So we made one slight modification to the lens. We with one that we made the peripheral curve one step flat and we ordered this lens for the patient. And this peripheral um, change was made to increase the edge lift as well as patient comfort. Here's a picture of the lens at dispense. The patient described his vision as spectacular and was really happy <laughs> to see be seen so well. So he's seeing 2020 at this visit and he was motivated to push through the adaptation process. Some conclusion in clinical pearls. Some might wonder why and how a patient with 18 diopters of corneal astigmatism was seeing 2060 out of an eye or how even with 14 diopters of corneal astigmatism, he was seeing 2040. That's a lot of astigmatism. And I think part of the reason to help explain why he was seeing so well was he was kind of, he was a habitual squinter. So because of the with the rule nature, he was able to probably minimize some of that, but it's hard, but he was very happy with his vision afterwards. 
By topographical axial display, as well as the central K values, there appears to be the significant corneal stigmatism. However, a good fit was achieved with a rigid lens to a of only three and a half diopters. This subjective fit was validated from the topography data, which shows how the peripheral K values are within normal range of two and a half diopters in the right eye and four and a half diopters in the left. These mid peripheral Ks are what indicated the choice of a rigid corneal lens could be successful. If we were to design a lens based solely on the central case, then a much more torque lens would have been suggested. Any extra lens toricity is unneeded in this case. Because the rigid lens masked RM apical astigmatism, this patient was able to achieve 2015 vision. This visual quality will not be attainable through spectacle lenses or through a soft contact lens modality. Just a little update for you all. Um, RM returned for follow-up and reported spectacular vision, was excited to soon begin playing baseball with improved vision. RM reported great comfort and was able to wear his contact lenses for 15 hours or more a day. And based on his presentation case history, his corneal thickness will be monitored annually for any thinning. Here's some references for you. And um, any questions? Thank you. A special thanks to Dr. Matt Lampa, Dr. Carolyn Uli Rima, and Pacific University College of Optometry. Colossandra, we have a, a question. Did you, can, did you evaluate for angle recession given the traumatic history? We did, we did, there was no, as, as far as the anterior segment exam too, we, there was no signs of any um, pigment in the angles or, and we did perform gonioscopy on him. His pressures were normal. Everything was pretty unremarkable in the anterior segment. We did um, do gonioscopy on him and there was no sign of angle recession. Fantastic. Next question. Would you consider a hybrid lens due to his participation in baseball and concern of lens decentration or debris um, in his sport? Sure, that could definitely be. There's lots of options to consider. This is um, a little bit of a, this was his first time wearing a GP. So just based on simplicity and the first time that he had presented to clinic, we were going we went kind of the more simple route to see what kind of vision he would be attainable first. There was also always a backup of the hybrid or even a piggyback lens system for the patient. Um, just different options, but we decided to keep it simple and he was seeing really great and he was so happy with his rigid contact lenses. He was able to really quickly remove them too. Um, another thing to think about too would be um, that he had very neat, he physio, um, his physio, physiological fissures were very narrow as well. Even putting in soft contact lenses in the past, he struggled to do. So a hybrid lens because of its larger diameter might have been a little bit more challenging for the patient to insert and remove successfully. All right, perfect. All right, we're going to put up the polling questions now. Miriam Fatu-Rai is a fourth year optometry intern at MCPHS College of Optometry in Worcester, Mass. She's originally from Iran. She earned her first undergraduate degree in computer science and software engineering in 2009. Then she immigrated to the United States in spring of 2010 and followed her dream by attending the University of Houston and pursued her second undergraduate degree in biotechnology and bioinformatics. During her junior year, she became interested in doing research at Houston Methodist Hospital Department of Infectious Disease while attending school. After graduating in the spring of 2016, she moved to Boston and started a position as a research technician at Mass General Hospital in the Department of Neurology. Her participation in different research projects and collaborations led to multiple publications in the field of infectious disease and neuro neurological sciences. Miriam later joined the optometry program at MCPHS College of Optometry in 2018 to pursue her doctorate in optometry. While attending school, Miriam did not put aside her research passion and joined a research team at UMass Medical School in her third year to study retinitis pigmentosa and presented her work at the American Academy of Optometry meeting in 2020. Thanks, Miriam. Take it away.
Thank you, Didi, for the uh, introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this uh, tonight, right before part two. I have part two tomorrow as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with my slides. So uh, my uh, presentation is over misdiagnosis of soft contact lens induced limbal stem cell deficiency. I saw this patient in my first rotation at the Ambrosio Eye Care. Uh, while I was working with cornea specialist, Dr. Chen. So before starting the case uh, presentation, I want to refresh the, all of us on uh, some terminology. So as we all know, the limbus area uh, is the corneoscleral junction loaded with limbal epithelial uh, stem cells for epithelial regeneration. And the most important function of this area is the biological barrier of preventing conjunctival cells to immigrate over, uh, over uh, the cornea and also preventing from the new vascularization. Uh, limbal epithelial stem cell deficiency, so this, this barrier kind of has problem. And now what's going to happen is those cells from the conjunctival will uh, uh, immigrate over the cornea and also some new vascularization uh, on the epithelium or stromal will be seen. Why this is important for us? Because limbal stem cell deficiency in advanced stages can cause uh, vision impairment and, and vision loss in the patients. What are the some same signs and symptoms? The signs that you as a doctor can see is corneal surface irregularity, epithelial stromal vascularization, as I mentioned, surface dryness, and corneal opacification. Some of the symptoms that your patient may uh, suffer from is foreign body sensation, tearing, discomfort, redness, vision fluctuation, photophobia. But isn't it just dry eye? So the patient came to the office with all of these symptoms for a couple months, and uh, doctors was just acting like dry eye and very uh, going over the dry eye treatment, as we all know, putting um, heat masks, low dose, uh, low um, soft steroid and restasis and all of the care that we always do for dry eye. Um, and this patient was still having suffering from the symptoms. So the doctor was referred her to the cornea specialist that I was working with her at the time. So now the case, case presentation of this patient, 55 year old Caucasian female mechanical engineer and full-time soft contact lenses for over 35 years. And she uh, confessed that she was sometimes sleeping in the contact lenses. The chief complaint, as I said, foreign body sensation, discomfort, redness, vision fluctuation, and photophobia. Patient reports no significant improvement with current medication and treatment. And this really looking for help. Ocular history, what they diagnosed her before was severe chronic keratoconjunctivitis sica. And the current medication at the point was restasis twice a day, soft steroid FML, uh, punctal occlusion, and heat mask and leave massage. So the medical history basically unremarkable, except uh, we could see some uh, papillae uh, two plus papillae uh, superiorly and trias papillae inferiorly. Her entrance vision was 2200 and with uh, correction 2040 plus two and 2070. However, this vision was fluctuating between 2050, 2070, and the pinhole was 2030 ish in each eye. We did some pentacam for maps uh, selectable to check the irregularity of the corneal surface. And this is fluorescein with cobalt blue filter. So as you see those irregularity, this is the left eye of the patient. Uh, the overgrowth of uh, the uh, conjunctival cell over the corneal cell. Um, and you could easily see, see that with the fluorescein uh, with cobalt blue filter. The fundus was unremarkable for this patient. Uh, PVD, OU, um, 
this is not the actual patient's eye picture, but I just wanted to visualize how that epithelialization happened and the corneal um, stem cell deficiency. So the finding was conjunctival tissue progression over the corneal epithelium, vision fluctuating secondary to corneal surface irregularity, blurred vision, best corrected vision 2040, 27-ish, um, and painful. It was painful secondary to recurrent epithelial breakdown and erosion. So the diagnosis on this patient was mild to moderate limbal epithelial stem cell deficiency secondary to contact lens overuse. So as a management, we started uh, with complete cessation of the contact lens. However, the previous doctor asked this person, this, this patient to stop using it. She stopped using it for two weeks, but she went back to soft contact lens. And, uh, but at this visit, she promised that she's not gonna use the soft contact lens again. Uh, and topical corticosteroid uh, for coming two weeks after the, this, the first visit and preservative free artificial tears for full recovery and uh, alleviate some symptoms. And we fit this patient with a scleral contact lens and that was the game changer for this patient. As you see, uh, for this specific patient, since there was some defect over the cornea, we decided to uh, go a bit higher vault on the cornea to have the enough clearance on over that defect. And these are the anterior sac um, OCT of the fit. And as you see, vision 2020, that was amazing. The outcome from this uh, case was really interesting, was really interesting for me. And that was one of the reasons that I decided to share this case history, case, uh, clinical case with other student doctor and uh, see the, the very first thing is diagnosis of the condition. And the second thing, the amazing results of the scleral contact lenses that can make a huge difference in the patient's uh, vision. And as you see, the central vault is a little higher. It's 540. And the temporal vault, which we really needed for this case because the uh, defect was temporarily on the left eye, and we wanted that... Uh, to have enough clearance to not get more irritation on the cornea for this patient. So vision this scleral contact lens is significantly improved to 2020 with reduced foreign body sensation, discomfort, and photophobia on this patient. Soft contact lens induced uh, LSCD presents with similar symptoms to care to conjunctivitis sicca. Therefore, the right diagnosis of the condition can save a patient's vision. Fluid-filled scleral contact lenses are valuable in the management of severe ocular surface disease. And also scleral contact lenses also promote a better environment by reducing ocular pain and photophobia associated with severe ocular surface disease. And these are some references that I used for this case presentation. And thank you so much and happy holiday in advance. And a uh, special thank you for Dr. Michael Fu at Del Ambrosio Eye Care, Dr. Stam, uh, and also Dr. Frank, uh, also at CPHS College of uh, Optometry. Any question? Thank you, Miriam. If you have any questions for Miriam, please put them in the question box. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and have you put up the poll as we're answering questions, if you wouldn't mind. Um, what was the modality of the soft lenses that the patient was wearing? The patient, the patient, sorry, uh, the patient was using monthly contact lenses for uh, so many years. Okay. What amount of vault would you, uh, what about amount of vault would make you concerned about um, exacerbating the stem, the limbal stem cell deficiency or cause a lack of oxygen to the cornea? For this patient, our concern was more having enough vault and clearance uh, to not ex exacerbate that uh, stem cell deficiency. Like the, and the minimum that we get after 10 minutes that we measure, it was 50, which was good enough to have that clearance over that defective area. Okay. 
Thank you, Miriam. I'm going to ask our next presenter to go ahead and put her slides up. Our next presenter is Veronia Abadir. Veronia is an Egyptian, originally from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. She's been working in the optometric field uh, as a technician for four years before pursuing a passion in as an uh, optometric doctor at Nova Southeastern University. She graduated with a bachelor's of science in vision sciences and hopes to continue to pursue her passions of education in anterior segment disease and contact lens fitting following graduation. She is a fourth year student. And as she says in her fun fact, she is a Canadian hiding from the cold in Florida. <laughs> Take it away, Veronia. Thank you, Didi, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, today, I'll be presenting a case of bilateral congenital cataracts titled Little Lenses for Little Eyes, Correcting Aphagic Children. So congenital cataracts, also known as infantile cataracts, are opacities that occur in the crystalline lens during embryological stages. They could be a result of either genetic mutations or infectious and environmental insults. Other associated findings include microophthalmia, microcornea, aniridia, coloboma, as well as persistent fetal vasculature, among others. In order to further reduce any complications on the development of the child, immediate extraction of the, of the cataract is actually required to reduce the risk of developing deprivation amblyopia. Status post the lensectomy, these children are left with high refractive errors and therefore require immediate correction either with an intraocular lens implant or a contact lens to further reduce the risk of developing refractive amblyopia. So an eight-year-old Caucasian male presents to the Eye Care Institute for contact lens fitting. He presented with longstanding blurry vision, both at distance and near with his current bifocal spectacles. His medical history revealed congenital CMV syndrome as a result of an in utero cytomegalovirus infection that was transferred from the mother to the fetus through the placenta. As such, he was suffering from polymicrogyria, which is an abnormal brain development of the gyrus in the brain where it, there's additional smaller folds. His ocular history revealed bilateral aphakia status post a bilateral cataract extraction, lensectomy, and vitrectomy in 2013. He had amblyopia and strabismus, status post a bilateral medial rectus resection in 2014. And finally, he had developed aphakic glaucoma in the right eye and was currently suspect for it in the left eye, but he is being managed with both Salatan and Cosopt. His refraction revealed plus 18, minus 250, axis 165 in the right eye, and plus 1750, minus 3, axis 3 in the left eye, and hit currently with an add of 275. His distance visual acuity entering was 2050 OD, OS, and OU. Pinhole showed minimal to no improvement, and at near 2030 OD, OS, and OU. His exam findings revealed full confrontation fields pinpoint pupils, but despite that, they were equal round and reactive to light with no afferent pupillary defect. His extraocular muscles showed full range of motion on his right eye, but they did demonstrate an overacting inferior oblique on his left eye. His intraocular pressures measured at 27 millimeters per mercury on the right eye and 19 millimeters per mercury on the left eye via eye care. As for his HVID, it measured at seven millimeters on the right eye and eight millimeters on the left, which is consistent with microcornea, given that it fell below the range of 10 millimeters. As for his IPA, it measured at eight millimeters on the right eye and nine millimeters on the left eye. And I hope that through the photo, it's appreciable the uh, microcornea and the microphthalmia, but also take note of the inferior eyelid margin that falls significantly below the inferior limbus this later posed a little bit more difficulty when it came to the contact lens fitting. So we went ahead and performed topography using the Oculus Pentacam, and the results revealed a irregular astigmatism on his right eye and a regular with the rule of astigmatism on his left eye. 
Given the findings, when it came time to selecting his contact lens, we found that a soft contact lens would not have been a viable option given his corneal irregularity and the continuous use of his topical ophthalmic medication. A scleral gas permeable contact lens actually would have provided the most ideal fit, but actually was a contraindication given his glaucoma. So we went ahead and fit a corneal gas permeable contact lens due to their high customizability. We fit diagnostically using the Advanced Vision Technologies Pediasite lens. This lens is specifically designed for aphakic children, so it comes in that high plus powers. The initial base curve was selected based off the topography results, and it came in the standard 9.3 millimeters diameters. So if we take a look at the photo, despite this being a corneal GP, it fit his eye more so as a scleral GP, just given his microcornea. Additionally, we can see that we have an interpalpebral fit with excessive inferior decentration, and upon examination, we noted excessive movement as well. Given the findings, the modifications that were made and ordered from AVT, the diameter was brought down from a 9.3 millimeters to a 6.8 to allow for better corneal fit. Additionally, in order to allow for better centration, just given the weight of the lens and the inferior eyelid lacking support, we reduce the center thickness the most that we can in order to allow for better centration. But we had to be careful to not reduce it excessively, which could have resulted in increased flexure of the lens on the eye. Additionally, the left eye lacked a little bit more stabilization, so we went ahead and did, used a toric fit in order to increase that. We can see with the photos below that there is still minimal to moderate temporal decentration, but despite that, his visual acuity was achieved at 2030 on the right eye and 2025 on his left eye. So congenital CMV syndrome results in a number of neurological defects. A study done in 2017 found that it was actually one of the leading causes of congenital cataracts. Currently, there is no direct link to the microcornea and microphthalmia to the congenital CMV syndrome, but it may be more so attributed to developmental delays as a result of the infection. In addition, the fragile nature of the, develop of the binocular system during the stage of development makes it crucial to actually extract the cataract immediately so that these children don't develop deprivation amblyopia. But as stated earlier, once the lens is removed, these children are left with high refractive error and require immediate correction, either with an IOL implant or a contact lens to then further reduce their risk of refractive amblyopia. A study done by Lambert in 2020 compared the two groups and they had found actually that the group that was corrected with IOL implants had an increased risk of development of strabismus as opposed to the group corrected with contact lenses. The final complication that could result is a fake glaucoma. A study also done by Fredman back in 2021 found that there was an increased risk within 10 years of the lensectomy. Additionally, the younger the child was at the time of their surgery, the higher their risk and the smaller their corneal diameter, also the higher the risk. So in the case of our eight year old patient, he actually checked off every box here. So his risks were additionally increased. The American Academy of Ophthalmology actually identifies contact lenses to be the ideal course of correction, status post lensectomy, as opposed to IOL implantation, just given the high post-operative complications. They selected two lenses that they fit the infants in after the lens is removed, and they found a silicone elastomer soft contact lens, um, which has a decay of 340 to allow for increased oxygen, and it is designed specifically for these AFAKs. Um, as for the gas permeable contact lens, we know that they are highly customizable. So we have the ability to alter the power, the decay to allow for increased oxygen, as well as the diameter and the base curve. The limitations of our contact lens fitting was his microcornea, the irregular cornea, his eyelid anatomy, as well as his AFAK glaucoma. Nonetheless, I am pleased to say that a successful contact lens fitting was achieved for him using a small diameter corneal GP in which he actually achieved the highest level of distance acuity he had received before. Later on, we did fit him with bifocal spectacles just for additional safety as well as his improvement on near work. 
And thank you very much. And special thank you to Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Victor at NOVA for all their support throughout this process. Perfect, thank you, Veronia. Uh, I am gonna ask you, we are running a little behind. I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and put the poll up if you would while we ask um, a few questions of Veronia. So with the two different size corneal diameters, the left being bigger, but the same diameter of corneal GPUs, do you think a little larger diameter on the left eye would have helped with fit stabilization? So we actually initially tried that as well. We had two different um, size diameters, but there was still a lack of centration on that left eye. And I don't know if it's potentially attributed to also the larger IPA that he had. Um, but the best ability we were able to achieve was actually giving him more of a, a toric fit on that eye. Did you consider using a minus lenticular to help with the upper lid to hold the lens? Actually, we didn't, but that actually would have worked really well just to, uh, to actually increase the stability. Um, that would have been the next thing, either that or an aspheric lens as well, potentially. Fantastic, thank you, Veronia. All right, I'm gonna ask that um, Jennifer get her slides up if she would. Perfect, thank you. Um, this is Jennifer Dang. She was born and raised in Texas, go Texas. She's a fourth year student attending Salus University in Pennsylvania College of Optometry and is currently in Michigan on one of her rotations. Her goal is to finally to learn to snowboard and ski for the first time. She uh, loves to explore new places and go hiking. In addition, she loves to play basketball. She says even though she's short, she can shoot a mean three-pointer. She loves to watch TV shows and movies as well. Her favorite TV show is How I Met Your Mother. And her favorite movies are Stuck in Love and Claws. Take it away, Jennifer. All right. So my name is Jennifer. I'll be presenting my poster called Searching for the One. Um, it's basically a lens fit about uh, on cornea ectasia, post-penetrating keratoplasty. And the next one, thank you. Um, just to uh, start off, I'm going to talk about my case. Uh, my subject is a 52-year-old African male with an ocular history of keratoconus in both eyes, and he has a penetrating keratoplasty in the right eye since 2012. His chief complaint that day was hazy intermittent vision in the right eye that has been worsening over a six-month period. His current lens modality in that right eye was a monthly hydrogel contact lens with a visual acuity of 2070. And in that left eye, he was wearing an RGP lens that um, he expressed with good comfort and his vision is slightly reduced at 2030 plus. Under slit lamp examination, there was no issue with his corneal graft showing no signs of rejection, um, but there was some corneal epithelial edema in that right eye. And in that left eye, um, it was unremarkable. Okay, next slide, slide please. Okay, and since we were talking about corneal swelling, we have to take a look at the corneal thickness. Here, we're looking um, kind of mainly at the green boxes. It's showing the difference between 2015 and 2021 in his right eye. There was an increase of about 21 microns of his center thickness, which induced about six diopters of additional cylinder. And then now he presents with about 9.7 diopters of astigmatism. In the case of minimal amount of swelling without any signs of graft rejection, we concluded that his edema was due to soft contact lens overwear. So we treated it with Lodomax and Miro 128. And then thinking about how to correct his vision, our initial thought was let's switch him to hard lens. The tear film will be able to mask the astigmatism to provide for our better clarity. Okay, next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna look at the axial map. On the right eye, that's to the left, it's showing a ob oblate cornea, where it's showing it's flatter centrally in blue and steeper in the periphery, specifically at the 12 o'clock and six o'clock. That's highlighted by the red color. This is opposite of what a normal cornea would look like, and it's considered prolate, where the cornea is actually steeper in the center. While looking at this axial map, we can have 
a clear image of what a significant amount of peripheral tericity would be. So our game plan was let's fit him with a sclera lens in a prolate design instead to be able to vault over um, that peripheral tericity. And then to the right is an image of the right uh, of the left eye in comparison, just to show the lesser degree of ectasia compared to the right eye that is more localized. All right, next please. Here was our initial lens fit. Um, we decided to do that scleral prolate lens and we found an adequate fit um, that had slightly edge, uh, edge lift in the vertical meridian. So we decided to do peripheral curves to steepen the vertical peripheral curves while flattening the horizontal cur uh, peripheral curves to accommodate that. Um, in the left eye, we noticed uh, that the lens he was coming in with, he had no issues besides just slightly reduced vision. So we updated the power and just ordered with the same lens parameter. Um, he was wearing a tri-curve GP with a plus carrier lens regular due to the uh, high minus um, power. After dispensing the scleral lens for his right eye, the patient reports he no longer wishes to proceed with a scleral lens and that he preferred with um, RGPs for both eyes due to the convenience of insertion. Okay, next please. Now here he's at his follow-up, so we have to refit his right eye. What do we do? So we're gonna go with a reverse geometry. The reason why is because his oblate cornea, the reverse geometry will help be able to fit his his cornea a little bit better due to the fact that it has a secondary curve that is steeper than the base curve to accommodate the patient's peripheral tericity. In our uh, lens set, there was a max of four diopters of reverse geometry. So that's the one that we chose. When we looked at the fit, it showed that there was some contact on the graft host junction and there's bearing sensorily and excessive edge lift. So it's showing that the edge, um, the lens itself was too flat. So our game plan is to let's figure out how to avoid that graft host junction area and also steepen the lens. First off, to decrease the contact of the graft host junction is to decrease the diameter. Then we thought about steepening it to avoid that uh, that flat bearing and edge lift. So that's what we did next. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then here we're looking at the elevation map and we're trying to figure out what to do um, for those areas. Um, what we're looking is at the true shape of the cornea and in the blue, it indicates the deepest areas of the cornea itself that corresponds to the steepness in the 12 o'clock and six, six o'clock. And the red indicates the highest parts where it's kind of closer to the coronal plane where it relates to the flatness of the cornea. And that's highlighted in the red where it's around the three and nine o'clock. And if you look towards the bottom, there shows a trend where you can see the arrow that it's pointing to. It's a valley-like trend showing um, the horizontal cross section of the cornea that highlights those areas of elevation in three and nine. According to Dr. Zhang's study in 2015, it's showing that there's an elevation difference of greater than 325 will cause um, RGP lens instability. And then um, with our patient, he actually had more than 350 microns of a difference. So that's kind of precluding to, uh, or foreshadowing to a difficult fit. So next slide, please. So here, this is what we did, um, what we looked at for our first reverse geometry dispense. And I'm showing on the left-hand side, the elevation map, which correlates to the pattern that we're finding in the middle. There's pulling at 12 and six, just like we mentioned before, um, correlating to the deep portions of the cornea, showing that it's steep, and the opposite bearing at three and nine. And the very right-hand side of the photos is an up-close photo of the graft host junction, uh, where it's making contact right there. So in order to correct this, we are going to um, request to do a torque reverse geometry lens. However, when we try to place the order, the lab consulted initiated an aspheric design instead. With the aspheric design, it will be able to steepen by increasing the amount of eccentricity 
basically how fast it will flatten towards the periphery in order to allow that steepness to occur. So that's what we try to do next. And here we can see that, so this is just an image from the contact lens spectrum to represent what the patient's uh, pattern kind of looked like. There was pulling centrally and they had some flat peripheral curves. So it wasn't a good fit. So we decided to just go ahead and reorder it as the original plan with toric reverse geometry instead. All right, next please. So finally we arrive um, at our final lens. So I just wanted to highlight the difference between our first dispense and our last dispense and highlighting some of those key components that um, are needed. So highlighted in yellow, first off is what we did by increasing the reverse geometry. We needed that to allow for better apical clearance. Then in turquoise, it's highlighting the area where we needed to um, pay attention to, to allow or to correct the horizontal bearing and vertical steepening. And um, that's how we were able to accommodate that by adding the torque peripheral curves. And then lastly in green, to avoid the graft host junction area, we increased the diameter, which also resulted in slightly steepening the base curve, which also helps with the clearance. Um, so after making these changes, this resulted in a well-fitted lens with good movement that provided the patient with good vision. Okay, next. And then just to con uh, just kind of run through what was uh, mentioned before. So basically our case, our subject um, kind of overwore his hydrogel contact lens that led to corneal edema that caused blurry vision. And then trying to get him to um, see well that, you know, he hasn't had great vision for six months, so like half a year. Um, Finding a great fit for RGP lens for him was a little bit difficult since he had that higher axial power along the 12 o'clock and six o'clock. However, he also had that highest elevation on the opposite side around the three o'clock and nine o'clock. And also the component of having to avoid that graft host junction and not causing any problems that would lead to a corneal rejection. So main things to consider is just to talk to the patient and just make sure that there's some patience between you and them in order to find the right one. And the importance of using a topography to kind of guide you through the best fit. And then also utilizing your fluorescein patterns and OCT imaging to make modifications in order to make it work. Um, all cornea ectasias are unique and present with their own fitting challenges. So as clinicians, we must be able to modify the lens fit that will provide our patient with the best comfort of vision. So it's not a not just a one and done thing. And then lastly, I just wanted to thank Dr. Guidish and the resident Dr. Fang for helping me understand some of these concepts because there's a lot involved in this fit. Um, so I thoroughly learned a lot while researching for this. And that's it. Thank you. Jennifer, how did when your the consultant suggested the uh aspheric peripheral systems, what happened um, to those aspheric uh, peripheries? Was it just too flat in general? Um, for the aspheric design, it was just creating a lot of cooling. So it just became too steep. And then uh, with the amount of edge lift that it was having as well, we just decided to just scratch that route and just went with our original plan. Um, I think the lab consultant was kind of utilizing the elevation map to kind of guide their method into picking an aspheric lens to kind of mimic a scleral lens. Hopefully that it would vault over um, just fine. However, it just uh, vaulted over too much. And I think it would have probably been um, probably like more of a lens fit trial, finding the perfect aspheric um, component. Perfect. Did you take into consideration the corneal HVID and the tericity in the periphery when you were designing the lens initially? Uh, yes, his HVID was 11.8. So just an average, um, average 
HVID. And what was the second part of that? How you took that into consideration. Oh, so first off, what we were thinking of um, to avoid the contact, uh, the contact of the graft host junction, we were initially trying to fit the lens within it. Um, however, it created a, a problem for the lens being too flat. So afterwards, we increased the diameter again um, to 11.5 in order to not have it, any issues with the junction. Um, but still not, you know, not fully like, like a scleral. Perfect. Thank you. Um, this concludes our presentation for the evening. I'd like to thank our presenters and the attendees for their participation. The winners will be announced within 48 hours when the poll results have been tabulated and the judges' decisions are made. I'd like to offer a special thanks to ABB Optical Group and Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care for their continued support for this program. Have a great evening and a happy holiday season. Stay safe out there.